this meeting is being All recorded. right, Jan, you're first. Okay, I, you know, not much has changed for me, which is positive thing in my life. My health is good. Uh, I'm able to summer in New Hampshire, although I'm feeling like I have Florida weather right now. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm blessed to have the life I have and I have good friends and family. And I had my family out from Colorado, which is, is always fun. The girls are 16 and 13 and they came alone. And then my daughter and her son came for another five days. So we had lots of fun. My 13 year old granddaughter was so excited. I mailed her an old mixer I had and my daughter said they're all going to get fat because every three days she's making cookies with the mix, which is fun. Um, I am going to be in Iowa. I'm leaving a week from today and I'm going to be there for about 12 days and I'm going to be in Washington on the second. I believe it's a Tuesday. I'm saying Tuesday to Wednesday and I'm staying over Lorraine Williams um, restaurant. I've rented a room there. So I don't know if anybody's around on Tuesday night to meet at Uncle Neff's. I thought that I'll be there and uh, I'm going predominantly to see my, my niece who's in Cedar Rapids. She's coming with me to Washington, but we are going to, um, I am going to see Joanne Rich. And I wanted to see her because she's in such great health and, and um, I'm anxious to see Joanne. So That's that great. really is the update on my life. I don't need five minutes. It's, it's pretty. Are you, are you still golfing? Do you, do, you still, do you still play golf? I still golf, yes. Good for you. Good I, for you. Uh, I had a really good day the other day. I played with, there's a group of us to play on Thursdays, and it's a mixed, it's men and women, and um, they, most of them I knew when I taught. So we have a lot of fun and a lot of laughs, and I shot a 46, so I'm pretty happy 46 for nine. Well, I, I, I drove around with Tom this morning on the golf course, and I saw people like Bruce Smith, Tom and Linda Lowe, and their son. And any lessons you can give Tom on how to improve his game would be welcome, I would assure you. I need him. Oh, actually, Tom, I, I am bringing my clubs. Oh, no, goodness. okay. Goodness sakes. You look great. You absolutely look great. Nancy, how about you? Share with us what's up. What's up? You, we cut you off before you told us where you were moving to. So share that oh, with us. No, I'm just moving across town to West Benton, real close to the university hospital. And with, with my son, we have been waiting, oh, three and a half years to get a decent place to live. It's so hard to find a home that you can get a larger wheelchair in. My son's a pretty good sized guy. So we're looking forward to having our new home in August. And let's see, I ha now have three great grandsons. Wow. And I haven't done any of that work. But uh, yeah, so I get to see pictures. Um, I talk with uh, one of my granddaughters, oh, several times a week as she drives to school. She's a pre-med student. And so because I was a nurse, I uh, and had chemistry and all this stuff that she's taken, I understand that. And that's really, that's a lot of fun. Uh, what else are we doing? Um, well, I'm busy taking care of my son, but I get in at least a mile walking every day unless we go to the university. And then it's like that, that's, I can put in a couple of miles inside the hospital there. Um, I'm just pretty busy taking care of my son. Um, that's uh, always a mother, right? Always a mother. We, we, always. we never stop, we never stop raising our children. We kind of change gears when our children have children, but yeah, that's, that's neat. We wish you success. We know that, oh, thank that, you. that you, you work very hard in, in, in caring for both of your health. Mickey, you. how about you? <clears throat> well, I just got back from Washington. So my husband and I uh, took the motor home and we went up to Minneapolis for my sister Holly's daughter's wedding. And we were there for, I don't know, four or five days. 
And then we drove down to Washington and spent two days and not enough time, but I did have time to have lunch with uh, Jackie Ross and Dwayne Hammond. So that was good. <clears throat> I actually didn't realize it had been so long since I had seen her. So she's suffering from the COVID. Well, so. not, not good. So when did you find a love affair with horses? Did you have horses as a young person? We did have some, but I didn't really, um, I wasn't too interested in them then. But somehow when we moved out here, west of Salt Lake, I thought horses would be important for our daughters. And so, you know, we started there. <clears throat> and well, and I, I really watched with interest. One of my, one of my friends would compete at the Wisconsin State Fair at the, at the draft horse. And it was a combination of Belgiums and Percherons and, and the, uh, all different species of the draft horses. And I know how much work it is, how, you know, the heavy tack and the, you know, big, big animals, you kind of make it look simple and I'm sure that it's not. It, it, it's labor intensive. I'll say that. How many do you have? Well, right now I have five, but uh, one of I know, too many, one's a baby and she'll be for sale. And then I have another gelding that's for sale. So I like to get it down to actually just two horses that I could manage easily. Do you so, raise their feed or do you purchase the feed, the hay, hay and such that you need for them is all purchased, right? Right. right. Goodness sake. Goodness sake. Well, yeah. keep so, posting it because so what you post on Facebook is very, for me, very educational. I enjoy it. And I, I'm, I, I, I love the fairgrounds kind of environment that most horse shows. And you know that my wife, Katie's sister, Sarah, makes a career out of showing quarter horses. Oh, I didn't and know that. She is, in fact, I think today she's somewhere in South Texas following a group. And it's, it's like 24-7, 360. She's uh, somewhere in a camper helping people show quarter horses. And <laughs> that's well, who was more. your friend in Wisconsin? Uh, it was actually a guy named uh, Sneckcloth out of near north of uh, the Sneckcloth family north of Davenport. And he was a salesman for a red dealership and they would take their, their draft team over and show in Wisconsin. Gotcha. All right, Sherry, you're up next. Shar Sherry, Shari. It's Shari, um, help, actually. Shari, my play. Yeah. Help us understand where you're at. I am just... In Des Moines, I've been here since '67, and have two adult grand or two adult daughters and five grandchildren, ages 15 down to seven, and they're kind of my life right now. So, love following them and their activities. Did you what career What career took you to Des Moines? Was it a marriage to your husband, or was there a career? Oh, it was my family family moving to Des Moines. When we were, what were we, sorry, we were, you left when we were sophomores? I left the junior, my junior year. Your junior year, yeah. Santos, right? Santos, right. Santos was my daddy, yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 And, yeah. And he, and where, where was he a clother for which one of the clothing okay. firms here? Dude, I want to say Wilson's. I think it was. Yeah. Was it Wilson's, Wilson's or? on the corner. Yeah. yeah. I and do then recall. Shortly after that, it was Klein. If I remember, if I remember right, he was. He, you could never not make him smile. He was always a happy guy. You know. And that's what that the clothing business was, does. Clothing. Yeah. Tom says the clothing. Tom says the clothing business makes you smile. Yeah. yeah. Right. You, you go broke smiling. That's the way it works. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, he was in a nursing home for five years because he had a stroke. But everybody wanted to sit at his table. He was a pretty happy guy. So I was a lucky gal to have him. No. Yeah, he was, he was, I would call him a neat guy. Well, you can see I've, I, I've asked for a surrogate to join us who was part of my life and uh, as part of uh, my Katie's life as well. Some of you may not recall, but Katie's home burnt down in the, her freshman year at U and I, and Sharon Riley Bovier was in the home with her parents at that, is that happening? So the Harry Potter look that you see, I see it at the bottom of my screen. You may see Sharon. Sharon, tell this group where you're at and how you live your life. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I live it really well without you for most of the time. Uh, living in Dallas, actually in a little town called Rockwall outside of Dallas. And I'm self-employed. I um, am in the sales world selling upholstery fabric to furniture manufacturers and have two girls and uh, five grandchildren and one great-grandchild. Hence the white hair and the glasses. I took, uh, I took a trip to Dallas in the last uh, three months and Sharon and I joined up for a, an evening meal together and we caught up and, and I think that's probably, well, you came back for a reunion here with okay. Katie's reunion probably six, seven years ago. Was that right? Well, last summer. Okay. We had one last summer, yep. All right, well, and, and so, I, I probably I probably do talk to Sharon almost as frequently as I talk to Kate. In all fairness, <laughs> it, it's, it's usually a more enjoyable conversation. Now, I see I David. Say, I think I probably like you more than Katie does. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That. And we should, we should, we should, this is being recorded, so I got to watch what I say. Yeah. All right, <laughs> David Johnson. Thanks for joining us, David. I yeah. give a wave. Hey, you can see who's here with David. you. Give this crowd a little update on David Johnson. I enjoy seeing your postings as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, you see me on Facebook, do you? I do. Yeah. I do. yeah. Um, well, I retired uh, five years ago. And uh, we, we re I retired rather quickly because my, we were living with my mother-in-law, taking care of her. And we thought she was about ready to go up, uh, toes up. So I bailed out of my job and then she lasted more than a year so we had a really fine last year taking care of her that was good and since then uh make the big changes i'm working in my own woods you know i was in forestry for 35 years and we neglected our own timber and now i get to spend a lot of time out in the woods myself so and uh, let's see in uh, 15 2015 uh, we joined a Skipper Key rescue group, and we've had a lot of dogs come through our house. And that's why Susan's not in here right now. She has three Skipper Keys out in the yard right now, keeping them quiet while we're on, on this visit. <laughs> so what, what would have pushed you in that direction? Do, did, do you and your wife have a Skipper Key as a pet? After it's, it's after we, got there, we, we got a Skipper Key from Jim Hess out at Grace Hill. And that was that was the finest dog we've ever had. Uh, and a, about a year after that, we got a, a female from him that uh, and we raised we actually had one litter of puppies out of her. And then after those dogs were gone, we didn't have skips again for a long time. Finally, in 12, I was up at our vet's office and I heard her heard one of the other customers there mention a skipper key. So I had to jump in, and find out what that was. And there was a, uh, a skipper key needing a home because the, the owner was uh, going into hospice care. So we grabbed, we were able to grab that little dog. He lived to be 18. But then because of him, we joined the skipper key rescue group. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. We've had a lot of people come to the house here to adopt dogs that we, that we took in as fosters. I would imagine that social media makes that possible. How would you otherwise communicate and know who has too many, too few, and there's, yeah. where's it, where does it headquarter out of? Uh, well, this the, our group is Midwest Skipper Key Rescue, and the lady who runs that is up at Belleville. So if you look on Facebook, you can look up Midwest Skipper Key Rescue, and uh, you'll see. Now we haven't, golly, we haven't had any dogs available available for quite some time. This COVID really messed that up, but in uh, in 2020, we had uh, well, we had seven dogs come through our home. Wow! Year wow. and since then we haven't had any. But uh, you you bring you you know you get a dog in and you find out you know you take care of its needs, find out how to get along with it, see if you can get the house breaking going again right because a lot of times these dogs come from bad circumstances, and then you find the right home for it. And we've, uh, the, our lady who runs this doesn't think we should do it, but we, we have people, if we find the right person, we just have them come right to our home. 
um, there's a little bit of danger there because animal rights people will do things like burn your home down, you know. But, uh, oh, but we, oh. we, we get <laughs> that, would, that would be a we problem. Get, we get everybody vetted out pretty good before we invite them in. They come and stay overnight and meet the dog, and it's worked out really well. And we've well, got blessing. it's kind of it's like foster home for dogs. That's yeah, a we've got that's yeah, we've adopted dogs from Maryland up to uh northern Illinois, down to Houston, Texas, out in Kansas. You know, we've had foster dogs go all over the place. And that's that's been a lot of fun. Yeah, good for you. Hey, Dave, uh, tell, tell Dave, tell them a little bit about your experience with reenactment of the World War One scenario. Oh, well, that was just uh that was over 20 years ago. Uh, the kid, you know, our kid uh, played the violin and he got in interested in doing, uh, oh, what was it? It's history fair, it was a thing they did in high schools. And uh, because he played the violin, uh, he started, he tried, he got an interest in Civil War music and started performing Civil War songs. And then he got into 1920s songs because we collect 1920s music. And uh, one of the things we have in our old record collection is a lot of World War I tunes. So he, he tried out some of those. And we looked for a way that he could do a World War I presentation. And we looked at a lot of different poetry from World War I. And if you, uh, if you study that, uh, most of that is really dark. Uh, people like Rupert Brooke and Wilfred Owen, they, they uh, wrote really dark poems about their experiences because, you know, they had terrible experiences. And, uh, but we settled on uh, Robert Service, you know, Robert Service that wrote the poems about the Yukon, the gold rush. Uh, well, he served in World War I. And he knew how to reach an audience. And uh, um, he was able to give you a sense of what it was like to be on the Western Front without putting you into a state of depression. He was really good at storytelling. So, so Zeke uh, learned several of the Robert Service poems and a bunch of World War I music. And uh, he had a great time with that. Uh, that was about a 45 minute presentation he would do. But golly, he hasn't done that ever. After he got off in college, he just quit doing that stuff. He's still got his collection of World War I memorabilia, but uh, he really doesn't perform anymore. But uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, do uh, you guys remember Country Joe McDonald? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Country Joe and the Fish, was that right? Yes, Country Joe and the Fish. Yeah. And he, he and his band... Uh, went to Woodstock. Are you familiar with how yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, re I remember he being announced in Woodstock. Yes, yes. Uh, anyway, he went to Woodstock and he was just standing around watching stuff on the stage and his band wasn't with him. He was just up there by himself. And uh, one of the organizers said, hey, come out here and entertain the crowd for a bit. And the crowd, went, they weren't really doing much. Gave him a guitar and uh, he told Country Joe to well, he told him to go out there and just entertain the crowd. And he said, they, you know, the crowd wasn't really paying attention. And so uh, he stepped off the stage and asked the guy if uh, he could do the fixing to die rag. It was scheduled to be on with his band, but his band wasn't there. The guy said, yeah, do whatever you want, because nobody's paying attention to you anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he went out there on stage and did the F cheer. If, I'm sure you're familiar with that. You know, give me an F, and yeah, I recall. Yeah, it started out with fish here with his band, and then he it it migrated a little bit, and then he did the fix to die rag, and that became a defining moment at the Woodstock Festival, and that I mean that ch changed his entire life. And when he got done with that, the guy said that was Country Joe McDonald, and he said that was the first time he'd ever performed solo and been named like that. And he was Country Joe McDonald from then on, and had a fantastic career. But uh, back in 1971, he recorded an album. And this, this goes back, I gotta take you back a little more. In 62, he got out of the Navy. And he got out of the Navy and was, uh, went in a bookstore on the, I think it was in Los Angeles, went in a bookstore 
and he saw this little book, Rhymes of a Red Cross Man. And it was the first book of World War I poems that Robert Service wrote. And uh, he learned those poems. And uh, after, after Woodstock, he got to thinking about those poems and he started putting some of them to music. And he, in 1971, he recorded an album, War, War, War. And it was all poems by Robert Service that he'd set to music. And it was a failure. He never performed those in public. And that, that album was a failure. But people kept, he said, people kept calling him and writing to him, wanting a copy of that. And it wasn't available. So 39 years after he first did that album, he did it again live up in Canada and recorded that whole album live. And uh, you can buy it yet. It's uh, War, War, War is the name of it. Go to Country Joe McDonald's page. And it, you know, if, if, if you remember him, you'd really love this album. It's, I think it's the finest thing he ever did. You make me sound so uninformed in vanilla. That's a, quite, that's a great story. That is <laughs> a great story. You are very, you're a very intriguing guy. That's <laughs> I, I'm clearly, and I, you know, my, my radio of choice as I'm driving down the road is sixties music. And, yeah. uh, and this probably because just the only music I understand. I, yeah. today, today's music just kind of goes right off the top. Well, All right. Most of what I usually have on in our car is uh, Rudy Valley. So <laughs> I don't want to be with that. Not too many people would remember him either, Dave. No, no you, you see him as an old man on Johnny Carson once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> that was about the end of his career. <laughs> Becky, thanks for joining us. We see you smiling. What we've done is gone around in a circle, and everyone's had a chance to kind of give a five-minute overview of what their life's taken them to, and it's your turn. Share with us. Oh, boy, I'm on the spot now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well... Uh, hello, everybody. Hey there, Becky. Good to, good to join you. And I've never done a Zoom call, so uh, uh, this, is, this is a first for me. Like I told Rick uh, recently, I'm kind of a tech dummy, but, um, but I'm glad I could uh, have my son figure out how to do all this. So uh, thanks for joining us. It's you great bet. to see you. Great to see you. Well, we had we had a, a last minute invite to go uh, uh, crabbing with friends on Camino Island, wow. but uh, uh, we will get to do it again. So, uh, um, and actually, uh, my husband Pat has uh, said that he he didn't he didn't feel very well. So, uh, so actually, it turned out okay, except for the fact he's not feeling well. So. Um, <laughs> But we have gone up to uh, Camino Island. I don't know if uh, uh, Tom Tom would probably know this because I know he has you know kids out here. But uh, it's just uh, you know about an hour's drive from us, and we have found a uh, our friends have a, a beach cabin they rent out occasionally, and that's where I spent my seventieth birthday uh, last year and last September. So it's nice to have that ability to uh, get away during COVID and have a safe place to hang out. So um, we have uh, uh, Pat's, of course, retired, although he works part time at uh, uh, a wine tasting room in Woodenville. And uh, it's called Pepper Bridge and Amavi. There's two different uh, wineries and uh, they're out of Walla Walla. And uh, so he's been doing that since he retired in 2014. And uh, it's been a little bit uh, a, more of a challenge during COVID, but um, he enjoys it. We were both in sales, the better part of our working careers. I was in women's clothing. And um, although my last job was in, um, uh, I was a librarian at a, a Christian school in a town just uh, south of us. So that was my last eight years of working. And then uh, Pat was uh, selling. Um, he went from men's shoes at Nordstrom to, uh, he has also sold pianos and organs for Sherman Clay. And um, then his last job was selling uh, appliances. He did that pretty much for the last 30 years. 
um, and I sold clothes. The last uh, retail outlet I sold clothes for was uh, Nordstrom. And um, then let's see, I've been retired since I, uh, 2009. And uh, we have uh, our two sons are just turned uh, 32 and 35. And one of them lives with us. He's a, a tech guy. And uh, unfortunately, he's able to work from home instead of driving to Bellevue. And uh, our oldest son works in Seattle. And uh, we get to see him occasionally. Um, so, um, and I will, I will share with you, I just in the last two hours had a, uh, a very deep conversation about the FFA. And it, it made me remember your father and the contribution he made to the young people in the agricultural yeah. world period. We're just coming off Washington, Iowa's county fair last week. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think it's one of the largest animal fairs in Iowa as far as the number of entries that they create here. And it's just creates great opportunity for the 4-H and FFA kids. Well, you know that I was a big 4-H uh, gal. Now, I'm going to set you straight. Uh, Dad was not involved with FFA. FBLA. FBLA. I should Future have Business that. Leaders of America. Oh, my bad. Okay. Well, now, who, who, that, was, who you, would have been the FFA advisor when we were in school then? I have no idea. We, had, we were connected. Dad was the leader of, uh, of our uh, Boys 4-H Club. Uh, there was Jackson Boys and Jackson Girls. And okay. at, at the time in 4-H, you couldn't, girls couldn't, we couldn't join until we were 10. I know the rules are different now. And uh, there was a lot more opportunities. The boys didn't have to be in a girls club to be in a boys club, but the girls had to be in a... Um, you know, a girls and boys club. Yeah. So, our, so yeah. I was in the Iowa Maidens. So in our anyway. 70 years, society's changed a lot. That's the fact. Our, I, our FFA guy was from Missouri, I think. I remember my I, Neil. I remember Neil guy Neil. with kind of dark hair. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember his name. Maybe I just yeah. associated because of the background with TJ that he was involved with. I was a member of FBLA as well. I remember going back in the annual and, and uh, the uh, the experiences that, that were there is equally as good. But, all right, oh. I'm going to let uh, I'm going to let Tom. Uh, it's it's going to be a short speech. He's not doing much, but I'm going <laughs> to let Tom uh, update everybody as to what he does with his lifestyle. And uh, mostly, it's I think it's mostly traveling with a fishing pole in his hand. <laughs> I do try and do that. All right, it's your I, turn. I want everybody to know that this is a really special occasion because I'm here and Rusty's here and I actually get to say something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that that makes it for a different uh, a different day. What was that you showed me there just a second ago? Oh, yeah. Uh, Anyway, as far as what I do, Rusty's pretty close to right. I uh, I ran a clothing store here in town for 20 years, and I went to work in the medical device business for, I don't know, 11 or 12 years. And then in somewhere around 2009, I retired and really didn't tell anybody. And I kind of had this little consulting business and ran it till 2000. And 16, I think. And then I fully retired. So Peg and I are here in Washington in the summertime. We have a home in Arizona in the wintertime. Uh, we like going down there. Uh, we like, we have a side-by-side. -side. It's called a razor. We drive around in the mountains in that. Uh, I hike and uh, play golf, play tennis. I, I enjoy Arizona. Um, when I'm here, I pretty much play golf. I, I picked up a, a new passion. I paint pictures. I, I really, I really suck, but I enjoy. Well, it. You're really good at it. You're really good. At it. I don't know about that. So I, I enjoy doing that. So uh, I work in the yard. I paint pictures. I play golf. Uh, I walk, and then several times a year, I head to the mountains and and fly fish. In August, oh, yeah. I'm going on a. It's a six day trip. Mickey would like this. We get on horses 
and uh, we drive, we ride about 25 miles up this river in, in Wyoming. And that uh, takes about, I don't know, six or seven hours, eight hours maybe. Uh, we set up a camp and then we fish up and down the river for uh, six days and then we come back. And uh, so I, I enjoy that kind of thing. Um, I have two kids. Uh, Jennifer lives in Naperville. She's married and has two children, the oldest of which is going to the University of Arizona uh, next month. Uh, and then my younger daughter, Katie, is not married. She lives in Des Moines and uh, she's lived in Seattle, Denver. I think she was in Salt Lake for a while. Or maybe she just worked there for a while. But now she lives uh, in Des Moines and is, is quite happy there. Um, we just got back from Michigan. Uh, we were up there for a week, family vacation, Airbnb deal. And so uh, we stay pretty busy and just biding our time, I guess. It's good to see everybody. And Sharon, it's particularly good to see you. <laughs> oh, uh, say say oh. hello to my cousin. Tom is good. <laughs> I Tom will is say, good. Sharon. <laughs> Thank you. Tom is going to live longer than Dick Clark. I mean, you know, he's abso absolutely well preserved and in good health, and uh, and clean living, I would say. And he lives, you know, he's probably our anchor for me anyway. Now with with John Berto's passing, he's my anchor spot here in Washington, and I kind of catch up what's happening with him. But I'll be quick with mine. Uh, Kate and I, fifty two years married. Uh, and, and we will be celebrating uh, our son's birthday next week, our oldest child on Virginia coast. We have two boys in Virginia and a daughter in Kentucky where we live in Lexington. I, I, my hobby is connecting people, really. I, I stay connected with uh, Mike Hennigan and Mark Myers very, very frequently. I saw Mike a month ago when I was on my way to Atlanta, had lunch with Mike and, and catch up with Mike and his family. Just yesterday, I stopped in Mount Pleasant on my way here and saw John Lance and mm. spent some time with, with John. And he's turned his business over to his son, Robbie, and doing very well with it. And uh, what I do now, I have two gigs. One, I coach millennials, kind of life coaching in the ag world, and uh, have 12 young people. In fact, I have a website that's under the name McCabin. And McCabe happens to be the name of my first three grandchildren, Mac, Kaylee, and Ben. So I, I do that work. And then I've consulted with ag dealers with another friend, and we have a, a machinery advisory group. And I just love the ag game. I just love agriculture, probably because of the authenticity of the customers and the people that are in it and the essential nature of us eating food. So I spend my time doing that, but I really do enjoy connecting back with friends like Tom and John and Mark and, and Mike. And it, I, I could, if you could ask me the names or not the names, but the dates of my grandchildren's birthdays, I wouldn't have a clue. But if you ask me the score of the Mount Pleasant game our senior year, I can almost <laughs> tell you what the score was by quarter. So you never get out of the past, if you will. So we have two people that have joined us. I want to give them time, and I want to give Rick you time as well. Steve Davidson, you're in the dark, but we know you're there. Uh, I don't know if you have a camera or not, or maybe if you joined by cell phone. But Steve, I think it's Steve Davidson. Could you give us an update on you and your life? That's Tom. Actually, it's Steve Weeks. Is, is, is it Steve Weeks? Yeah. Hi, Steve. Steve Hi. Weeks. It's great for you, buddy. Hey, tell us about Steve Weeks. Good. Well, we have a camera here, but neither my wife or I can figure out how to get it going. So <laughs> I'd be blessed to not have to look at me. That surprises nobody on this call, Steve. <laughs> tell us yeah, about we're, you, buddy. We're doing well. Kathy has uh, finally retired uh, again, maybe for the last time, maybe not. Um, she was with uh, Holmes Murphy Insurance out in West Des Moines, now in Waukee. Uh, I've been retired since 09. Uh, we keep busy with grandkids. We have 11. Oh. And uh, we have a very big garden, so I spend a lot of time outside playing in the dirt. Uh, have a lot of fun with that. 
she has three kids who all live in Norwalk, and I have two sons, one who is in Des Moines and one who is in Kansas City. Um, some of you may have seen pictures from our fishing trip up to Ontario here a month ago. Uh, my grandson caught a fish as big as he is. Mm. And there were three kids along, and the three boys caught the three biggest fish, which was a, outstanding. Uh, we had a lot of fun. It's a, it's a camp that is an hour and a half boat ride from civilization. Uh, wow. there, there are some solar collectors on the roofs of the cabins, but that's the only electricity. Uh, no cell phone service, um, outhouses. That's the only thing positive about COVID is that the outhouses hadn't been used for two years, so they were fresh. <laughs> um, we had a wonderful time. We were up there for five days. My son and, and his son and his good buddy and his two sons and then his buddy's dad. So we had, we had quite a trip. We spent five days up there. Steve, I recall one of our last times together, I think you were healing from a pretty serious motorcycle accident. Is all of that behind you and everything's well? Well, actually, uh, that was my wife's accident. Got it. Uh, we were coming home from Kansas City and uh, we were within a mile of home and she was right behind me and a deer jumped right in front of her and she clobbered him and it messed her up pretty good. Uh, mm. She has pretty much recovered. She has pinky finger that'll never be straight again and she has uh issues with her shoulder that hit the ground first and uh she had a couple of teeth knocked out but they've been fixed and you can't ever tell it and, um she has very straight hair except for one place where she cut her head and it's funny the little cut in that part of her head the hair has come out curly <laughs> <laughs> it's strange but she's she's pretty much recovered and and we quit riding and that was in actually that was in 2014 so tom's tom's nudging me and say maybe if i'd go out and have a motorcycle accident i could have a recovery with curly hair you think there's a chance <laughs> <laughs> good luck it would take yeah. a lot of cuts in your head to cover it with hair yeah, all right. <laughs> I, I opened myself up for that that was my fault all right mr logan what we, we see on the wall that you you graduated somewhere it must did you go what? to grade school yeah, I think. No, no, I never, I skipped. Fill these guys in, Tom, with yourself. Uh, got three days? Okay. <laughs> well, first, first, it's good to live near weeks because you get free wood, free firewood. Oh, free firewood cutter? He, he does. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that's that's great. Too, Tom. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other thing. Um, and I see Dodie, uh, the sad news, the sad news is, is that Tom filled in for a family member of mine, my brother, who uh, Tommy was with him when he, he had a bad stroke on the golf course and died. Um, but the, the positive thing about that is as Dodie relates the story, my brother had about the best nine holes of golf he's had in two years. He did. He the light was shining bright before it went out. I would I would say yes. And my favorite my favorite memory of that is we were on member four T, and Jim was playing really well. And he looked at me and he said, "Here it is, the end of the season, and I'm peaking, and there's nobody here to see it." And I said, <laughs> "Well, what about me?" And he said, "Like I said, <laughs> it's the end of the season, and there's nobody here to see it." And then two holes later, unfortunately, it went another way. Yeah. I can't, Tom, I can't tell you how much I missed you. I, I, I spent some time with Ann. Well, that's another story. Yeah, yeah. And and we all and she's getting along fine. And and, yeah. we, and you know that every well, as fine as you can expect. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of like been bad news. Right now. Gene and I are in the midst of uh, of deciding that we're getting old, so we're going to move out of our house, and uh, we're we're in the midst of a condo renovation a few blocks from us, and so that's it. We're going to change addresses and live in about half the space, and be able to walk away from the place every winter and go somewhere warm. So that's about it. Other I know, I know, I know your wife's quite an author and a writer. I would yes. uh, 
I'd like her to write a book about you sometime so we can all hear the backstory. <laughs> no, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> we don't want to hear that. No, all right, no, we're good. She's still in the, yes, she is still in the author's business. She just is completing over the last four years now, the sixth book in a series. And they deal with, uh, it's kind of one of those, they're all connected to each other. It's kind of the story of a fictitious, but maybe not so fictitious family starting in pre-World War II, the early 1920s. And we're now up to Kennedy going to Germany to give the speech. So um, she's decided she's about, that, that story is going to end, I think, with book six. And then we'll see where it goes from there. She's having I'm a great time envious. and uh, we have something to talk about tonight. I'm very envious of someone who has that intellect and that character to stay with that, to become an author. Well, Rick, you were, Rick, you, you're an author. You captured your story in book, right? Yes. Yeah, I had a lot of fun what, doing what it. What motivated you to do that? Well, about the first week I started with hy in 66, I started witnessing all these crazy things that were going on in a grocery store. And, and there are things that people would swear never happened, but they did. And I thought, well, I better write some of this crap down because uh, I don't want to forget it. And as the years went along, I kept getting more and more little scraps of paper in my envelope. And I finally said to Jane several years ago, you know, these stories are all going to die if I don't write them up and get them in, in print. And uh, so one thing led to another. And I wrote a, a, just a, a book of 100 short stories of the funny things that happened to me in the grocery business. And uh, I incorporated a lot of Ivy history with it and uh, some things that were important to me, some quotes from the officers that I knew pretty well, uh, that sort of thing. But I had a lot of fun and, and uh, um, it's not a perfect write, but it's fun. It's, it's kind of fun to, uh, to be able to give a copy to somebody and just say, here, these are the crazy things that um, went on. It's a good book. It, yeah, it's good. Well, what was your badge number at High V? What, an employee? 47222 was my employee number. What? Four seven two 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 was my employee number, and uh, they changed that. You had if you hadn't been hired before nineteen sixty seven or sixty eight, they went to your social security number. But before then, we went with a five digit number they gave us, and that was mine. Yeah, but, I, I asked that because I was just with a gentleman whose number was like like 127 with Edward Jones, and you know you can look back in our era of these great companies that were started and, and people being, you know, some of the very launching employees of that to go on and, and what those companies become today. All right, I, is any, have I missed anybody that hasn't had a chance to kind of share with us as I go around? If not, if somebody has something they would like that they thought of now as we've gone around the room, raise your hand and, and I'll let you acknowledge, go ahead, Rick, your turn then, go ahead. Well, I, I could, a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to compliment all the ladies on here. You guys have kept yourselves wonderfully, and <laughs> it's all beautiful. Um, it makes me proud. It makes me proud to have had you in my life at one time or another because I realize how we were blessed. And uh, anyway, congratulations! And to the guys, you're looking good yourselves. But I'm not going to tell you you look great like the girls do because you don't. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to tell Tom Logan, I, I can't look at a ring of bologna without thinking about you telling the story of your mom making the fried bologna sandwiches out of the boys' bologna. And every time I see a ring of bologna, I think of your mom. And of course, uh, your mom and dad were so well known in town, but it was just one of those little things that I picked up on and it kind of sticks with me. Uh, well, but anyway. for, lunch, for lunch, you had a not a bologna, but a salami sandwich and olives. So that's... Uh, He's, he's stayed with that same diet. Maybe I ought to listen to him a little bit. Yeah. Now, everybody's good on our end. We're Fort Myers, Florida. Been here 14 years. And moved permanent. Uh, sold the house up north a couple of years ago. Moved down here to our place. And, uh, we love it. We, we enjoy the, the nicer weather most of the year. Live on a little lake and a lot of uh, wildlife and whatever. But we're good. Health is good. Uh, kids are all good. Uh, we have no complaints. Life's been good. I've had a great life. Well, on behalf of all your classmates, we all are very complimentary of the way you've held us together with the uh, Facebook page for the class. Not only <laughs> classmates that, that read and watch that, but uh, uh, Tom's neighbor here, Kay Sheets, will watch that. Uh, 
the coaches Robinson and, and Gary Olson watch that. And it's just a way of keeping us connected with what's happening. And sometimes it's not such good news, but we, we know we need to hear it. And other times it's very uh, uplifting news. So thank you for what you do to keep this group connected. You're all worth it. You're, You're all worth it. Every one of you. And, and, uh, you know, I think we are a close class. Um, and, I think we give a lot of that credit to you, Russ. You've been a, a good amount of the glue yourself over the years. And then individually, everybody just plain gave a damn about each other to where we've stayed with each other all these years. And uh, ups and downs and good health, bad health, we've all been there for each other when we needed to be. So I'd like to congratulate all of you. Thank you, Rick. Okay. I, I, need, I need get off, but I will look for the YouTube. Bye okay. guys. Bye. Enjoy your safe trip back to Iowa, Bye, Jan. Jan. Hey, Jan. Bye. Hey, send me, send me uh, a note. On, oh, Russ, yeah. I wanted to tell I wanted to tell Becky a quick story about Nordstrom's. Go the, for uh, it. You know, Hi always, here. Go ahead. You're on. Hy-V always uh, preached, you know, good customer service to everybody. So from the time you're a young kid until you end up retiring or whatever, you, you get it crammed into you about good customer service. Well, one of the stories that was always told to us was about Nordstrom's in Minneapolis. And the story went around that they refunded a set of tires for somebody uh, for a car and they didn't even sell tires. I believe it. <laughs> and that was used as an example to all of us about bending and going the extra mile for a customer to keep them a customer. And so that was the Nordstrom story. I thought you might enjoy it. Well, I, I have something to add to that, Rick. Um, we had, uh, I worked in a couple different departments, but it was all women's clothing. And uh, we had what was called the rent address program because people would come in and uh, buy a dress, hide the tags, wear it, and then return it. Oh, gosh. By golly, I never saw anyone get turned down. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was I, pretty. I'll, I'll share a quick story. We used to, um, Walt Stutzman used to take pictures of the homecoming kings and we would put them in the window. Well, this, her, she had twin sons. She came in and we used to let people take sweaters out on approval. So she came in, she got a bunch of sweaters, took them out on approval and brought them back, said the kids don't like them. She didn't realize <laughs> that the homecoming pictures were going to be in our window. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> A couple weeks later, I called her up and said, Linda, why don't you come in and get the pictures of your son? She said, what picture? I said, the homecoming picture. She said, oh. She walked <laughs> into the store, went over to where the sweaters were, took the two sweaters out, brought them over, set them on the counter, paid for them, said thank you, picked up the pictures, and walked out. Didn't say it all work. It, it was, I mean, she was just like, oh, my. God, because of course the guys had the sweaters on that she'd taken out on approval. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, oh, now hey, Tom. Hey, B, hey, can you hear me? Oh, who's that? Yeah. Steve, yes, Steve. Yeah. Hey, I uh, wanted to interject something to a Mr. Defensive guy there that must have been hitting the head too many times. As Coach Robinson, not Robertson. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna thank sick you. him on you for that. And he could probably still kick all of our fannies. <laughs> he can. I saw. I saw him. Uh, he, the last summer. I yeah, he looks summer. good. He came back to life. He had a, a heart attack. That's what. Oh, he and they actually, they gave him paddles back to life, and and a, a oh. twice. Yeah, yeah. And his his wife Brenda. If you if you're on Facebook with Brenda in our in our classroom, she's the one that loads up the uh, the the recipes. Oh yeah. And, you know, some of the recipes I looked at Brenda would load. It's no wonder he had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom, I know you and I are fraternity brothers. And one of the things after maybe after your law practice, you did some support of the fraternity. Every time I turn around and read a fraternity misbehavior, it, it seems to be it's our group. I, I think that they hold the record for being kicked off more campuses than the five six. He doesn't want to respond to that. Who are you? Who are you which Tom are you talking to? You, Tom. Tom Logan with the SAEs. Yeah. 
Yeah, I probably know a lot more about fraternity law than anybody in the country. I ended up for, <laughs> for three years, I was general counsel to, to SAE and it was a full-time job. Um, and at the time, uh, SAE had the had uh, 47 separate lawsuits pending against some across the country. Wow. The, wow. the only the only insurance firm that would insure them was Lloyd's of London. <laughs> <laughs> and they're one of the highest risks of Lloyd's of London. So I, we kind of got the rules changed and everything. And I spent two plus years traveling around settling claims. Um, and it, it, I have more stories about fraternities than you'll ever want to know. Um, yeah. Lloyd's, well, I just, yeah, Lloyd's today, Kelsey's you know, I know what our misbehavior was, and today there's so many other ways to do it. And, and that's before we had digital communication and social media. And today, there's no secrets. If, if you misbehave, it's captured on film by somebody. Yeah. Lloyd's, Lloyd's, Lloyd's tells the story, and I became intimately familiar with Lloyd's of London. Uh, they tell the story that, uh, that we are a very high rated risk. He says, in fact, there's only two other organizations in the world that are higher risk than fraternities. The first one was the space station. <laughs> the second one were nuclear power plants and then the third were fraternities so <laughs> so think actually in in defense um things at least at our fraternity and a lot of fraternities have have improved we disposed of uh pledge ship and um that takes all the hazing out of fraternities and hazing and fraternities happens for two reasons, pledge ship and hard alcohol. We made a mistake years ago by outlawing kegs. We should have allowed the fraternities to continue to drink beer. Nobody ever dies drinking beer. <laughs> they die from hard alcohol. And But, but stories, I got stories. I got too many, <laughs> too many. One, oh, one fraternity story. Uh, Bob English was in the fraternity, uh, same SAE. He was an SAE at Simpson, okay? So the SAEs nationally, which have about 14,000, over 30,000 living alumni, have biannual conventions at big cities around. Well, they decided to come to Des Moines and I got appointed to lead the convention. But one of the guys that was assigned to that was Bob's son. And the first time I met him, I was spooked because it was like Bob had just walked in the room. He, he acted the same, he sounded the same, didn't look quite the same. He looked more like his mom, which is a good thing. Um, but that connection to going back to high school, I found that out and then I got to reading, if anybody remembers in grade school, those of you weeks might remember, or I don't know who else in grade school. You guys remember Eric Hammer? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, sure. yes. Eric Hammer ended up being a band director out in California, and he was very successful high school band director. And I think they moved to San Jose, if I'm not mistaken. Well, what what's sad about it is I. He talked, we talked two times. We were going to get together the next time I was going out to California, which I do every year. And he died. Um, maybe this, that's been three or four years ago now. But from reading about him, he was well respected. He left, I think he moved out of town when we were in maybe in sixth grade or seventh grade. Does that seem right to you guys? Yeah. My parents were uh, friends with uh, his parents and they okay. would come out to the farm and we'd hang out together. So that sounds about middle school, late elementary school, they moved. Yeah, I think late elementary. My sister was a friend with Priscilla. Yeah. She came yeah. to visit one time, her grandmother, and we got to go over to her house and have tea. And I think, weren't they in Apple Valley? We had stopped and saw her one time. Uh, 
think I, I was. I can't remember the town they've lived in. I, I and I know it. I have it written down somewhere. But um, it, 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 really again, nice people. The, the nice thing about this today, I thought, Russ, when those kinds of stories come up and you haven't seen people for years, even that connection, even a connection like this, you know, we couldn't. The last time I talked to him, we didn't have this kind of thing, and I wish I had it then um, because you can get together now with people. So thanks for doing this. All right, what we'll do, I, I uh, like I said, to... I've, captured this, I've captured this on a video. I'll share that video link once I update it with, with Rick, and he's got the master list of the uh, uh, email addresses of classmates and extended friends. And maybe we'll talk about doing this sometime around the holidays, sometime around Christmas or New Year's as well, where people, yeah. I know your lives are full at that time, but uh, we'll, we'll select a time. Maybe it's quick. It's an hour. I enjoy doing it. I, I really, I get sentimental like Tom does, thinking about some of the experiences we've had together and, and the friendships. And uh, it just, it keeps us all young to remember that, that growing up together. And I, I appreciate this happening and, and, and putting it together this way. Rick, is there anything you want to say as we close off? No, but I think everybody in the world says they had a, <clears throat> a great class to grow up with, but nobody had a class like ours. Yeah. No. Nope. I agree. Can I say I something, agree. please? I relate some stories to my oh, grandkids. Sure. Only the better part of the stories to my grandkids. Uh, <laughs> they, what Char, they miss. Char has something. I'm sorry. Sure, Shari, go ahead. I just wanted to thank Rick for letting me into the website with you guys. Um, I know I didn't get to graduate with you, but I have fond memories of many. And Russ, I have to tell you that I have a daughter named Katie and we spell it K-A-T-Y because I always thought your wife was the cutest little thing ever. <laughs> and I always loved her name. So I have a daughter named after your Katie. <laughs> well, I'm going to point this out to my wife when I show the video and uh, yeah, she, I thought I married her for her looks, but I really married her for her intellect, I guess. And, and Sharon, you make sure you get that back to her as well, please. I, I just wrote, I wrote it down. How do you spell intellect? Can you, can, can, can you, embroider, could you embroider that on a pillow for me? Yeah, I'm going to get that engraved and send it to her. Sherry, right, have you been done. back to All Washington right. lately? Um, it's been a few years. I have a cousin, Vicki Thomas, that still lives there. Uh -huh. So I try to see her every once in a while. And my sister lives in Texas and we have a family wedding here uh, the first weekend in August. So we're going to try to get there maybe a day or so while she's here. But well, I was just thinking about you last weekend Why I was in Washington. My mother turned 97 oh my and we, and we went down Madison and of course, your house is no longer there. And then Warner's house on the other end of the block is no longer there. It just made me made me think of all the times that I snuck down that alley to sneak over by you guys' place and <laughs> looking for trouble. <laughs> hey, Shari, I, I, I can't remember whether it was last year. It's been a few years ago. I hadn't seen, you remember Mike Richard? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mike, I, I mean, I hadn't seen him for years and years. And I went to an Iowa wrestling meet and he was up there with his dad. And we were sitting, we were sitting there talking and your name came up because when we were junior high, Richard and I were pretty good friends and we always gave you a bad time. And he said, he, he was talking about people from Washington. I think he moved away when, I think we had our freshman year maybe. And then he oh, and another away. one, another one you always bring up that was came and gone was Krogmeyer. Oh, yeah, Krogmeyer calls me. Oh, I yeah. talk to Krogmeyer once a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, once from Washington, always from Washington. Okay. Yeah, Krogmeyer calls me up. He was uh, he he got a, a JD and he was a a human resources lawyer, and and he went to work. I don't know. He worked for some I don't know some sort of ATM machine or something in Frankfort, Kentucky. Then he got this job with this company called Balkan Materials, which is a huge company in california and he worked out there and he retired and it wasn't one time he worked for a casket company bates yeah, that, that was, that was in, yeah he was working for bates that, casket company and bates and for bates. perfect fit yeah i mean for cold work. yeah i would think so i would think so yeah all right everybody have a on the nice weekend and Russ, uh, the Russ. best to all of your families be good mm -hmm.
Becky has something to say. Hey, well, Becky, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll I wait. wanted to say, I say, a, tell you a funny story about uh, Washington because I've lived in a fair amount of states. And of course I ended up in Washington state. So when people ask where I'm from, I say I'm from Washington, <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> and every, wherever I've uh, lived, people think I have a Southern accent. accent. <laughs> and I say, well, I am from Southeast Iowa. So I said, I'm an Iowa farm girl first and foremost from Washington, I Iowa. I so I'm always gonna... proud to add that. Coach Harrington. There, there's no R in Washington, right? Yeah, Coach Harrington always busted our chops about that. It and was. Every time he heard somebody say Washington, Coach Harrington would say, would you spell that, please? There is no R. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Nancy, Russ, yes. Russ, were you in, you were in Miss McKee's class in first grade, right? And Lovey. I think I, I think I was. I remember Miss. I remember uh, Miss Cook in fifth grade. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing. We, she asked us all to spell wash, and she made the whole class cry because there was no R in wash. In wash. <laughs> uh, I, I talk Everybody about cried. Talk about southern <laughs> accents. In, in the the word Louisville is one syllable. And yeah. when, you're, when, you're south, when you're south of Mason Dixon Land, it isn't Louisville. It's Louisville. All of, you got to get your mouth full and say it all at one time. All right. If we could go on, we could go on and on and on, but my battery's low now. But thank you very much. Appreciate all your friendships and, and have a nice summer. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.